Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm reviewing the 2011 to 2014 series Batwing, part of DC's The New 52. This comic actually got its start back in 2010 when Batman first started putting together a team of international vigilantes to become Batman Incorporated. One of those members was David Zavimbi, also known as Batwing. Zavimbi was a wealthy doctor living in the fictional city of Matamba in the Democratic Republic of Congo, also referred to as the DRC. This character only appeared a couple of times in Batman Inc. before the main DC continuity came to an end and we got rebooted by Flashpoint into the New 52. Following the New 52, Batwing was now David Zavimbe, with an E, a poor, lowly police officer in the fictional city of Tanasha in the DRC. Why did they make these changes, you ask? I have absolutely no idea, other than, that is, that perhaps they make for a more interesting story to tell. I'm not really sure why Batwing, out of all the members of Batman Incorporated, was the one DC chose to make a comic about. Maybe they were just trying to emphasize their dedication to diversity by creating a comic about a black character. Maybe he was the Bat Inc. character Grant Morrison cared the least about someone doing their own thing with. Maybe Judd Winnick, the initial writer of Batwing, just really liked the character or the idea of writing about a Batman of Africa. I honestly don't know. Whatever the reason, it is surprising to see DC willing to go out on a limb with a story set entirely in Africa. Trying new things is the exact thing Thing that New 52 should have been perfect for, but we so really got to see it otherwise. Take Judd Winnick's other comic at the start of the New 52, Catwoman. That was little more than an extremely back-to-basics Catwoman as a sex object type story, which sadly is much more typical of what we got out of the New 52. So that just makes it all the more surprising that this comic exists in the first place. What's even more surprising is that the comic is actually good. Let's see just how good it is and take this away. David Zavimbe's struggle is real, human, and even heartbreaking. Africa is a harsh place screwed over time and again by the mainly white machinations of history, and this story doesn't shy away from that. Tanisha is a city gripped in an extreme version of those pre-Batman days in Gotham City. The violence, the corruption, the poverty, the disease, all fully on display here. David himself is an orphan, both of his parents having died from AIDS, just in case you weren't sure that this story really took place in Africa. While he and his brother Isaac were both young, they were found by General Ayo Kaeta. Kaeta is one of many egomaniac warlords throughout the region that believes it's their destiny to rule the DRC and eventually Africa. David and Isaac quickly make a name for themselves among the child soldiers in Kaeta's army, and they prove to be the most skilled of his warriors. But they still have lines they won't cross. At one point, after clearing a village, Kaeta's army starts to gather up the women and children. The children to draft as warriors and the women, well, for obvious reasons. That's the line for David and Isaac, though, and they stop all the soldiers, children and full-grown men alike, from getting their reward. Instead of punishing them, Kaita actually promotes them. This promotion doesn't last long, though, as soon he too crosses a line the brothers are not cool with. After tracking down one of his enemies to a remote village, the dragonflies offer to sneak in and murder the man. Kaita says it's too risky, though, and orders his men to instead blow up the village, including all of the innocents the man is hiding behind. Isaac fires off a gun to give away their position, preventing the slaughter, but putting them under attack. After defying his orders, Kaita punishes Isaac by slicing him up with a machete and throwing him off a cliff. David disappears into the underbrush, but later returns to kidnap Kaeda while he's sleeping, and drives him out to where the enemy from before is now hiding out. He does this because he declares he will not kill anymore, and like the Batman Begins Batman, he doesn't consider leaving someone to a certain death to be the same as killing them. He ends up at a charity home for former child soldiers run by a man named Matu Ba, and a woman named Rene Diallo. There's also another child soldier there, a girl named Rachel Niamo. Flash forward a few years and we get to five years ago, or five years before the start of the New 52. For those that don't remember, the New 52 established that the entirety of DC Comics history occurred in five years. So this is the point that superheroes first started coming out of the woodwork, and Africa too got their own superheroes, a group called the Kingdom. I have to say, I love all the history that went into the creation of this series. Winning must have spent so much time developing the history of Batwing and the DRC. It's a real shame that we hardly get to spend any time with the Kingdom. This group fought during the years before the Congo was united as a democratic republic. In this period, the country was divided into three warring factions. You had General Masaka Okura, who ruled the country as a dictator, the various warlords, like Kaeta had been, and the people, a common man militia sick of Okura's rule, who wanted to take the country for themselves and institute a democracy. The kingdom helps lead the people to victory over the other factions, ensuring themselves an immortal place as heroes of the Congolese people. However, a dark secret tears them apart, and they disappear almost as quickly as they appeared. More time passes and David has grown into a young man and joined the police force of the DRC. 
He hopes to be a positive force for change, but it's not that simple. The police are extremely corrupt, taking bribes to ignore crime and stealing money off of corpses of victims that they then divide up among themselves. David can't stand the corruption, and eventually it pushes him too far. He puts on a ski mask and goes out at night as a vigilante to begin doing what he can't as an officer of the law, shutting down the criminals. He makes quite a stir as a vigilante, enough to gain the attention of Batman, who shows up to make him an offer he can't refuse. Now rebranded as Batwing, David continues to try to make a difference both as a police officer and as a vigilante. All this is just the backstory of the comic, basically a build-up to understanding what's going on. It's a lot to learn, but it just goes to show the time, effort, and care they put in developing not just David, but the world around him. It makes his efforts and struggles that much more real and serious. It's so much information that it takes most of the first 12 issues, and the issue 0 that came out between 12 and 13, just to cover it all. It's all done in flashbacks, though, as the series is primarily focused on telling a story in the present, just a present heavily influenced by the sins of the past. A lot of it is covered by artist Ben Oliver, who I want to point out because his art is absolutely gorgeous. Seriously, this is probably the best looking comic I've reviewed so far, at least for the five issues he handles. Marcus Toe, or Two, or I'm not really sure how that's pronounced, sorry, takes over for Oliver, and he does his best to make the transition away from Oliver as smooth as possible. His art is mostly strong, but it's still sad to see Oliver go, and there is definitely a decline in the quality of art from this point on. The present day arcs start with a supervillain named Massacre, who is living up to his namesake by hunting down the civilian identities of the members of the kingdom and killing them, along with anyone else who gets in his way. This includes, at one point, the entire shift working at the local branch of the DRC police force. Massacre knows the dark secret that tore the kingdom apart, and because of their sins, he feels they deserve death. Massacre has his own dark secret, though, and it's something straight out of David's own past. I think this story was supposed to last through the first two volumes, or 12 issues, of the comic. Instead, after issue 6, there's an unexpected twist that sends Batwing and Batman to Gotham to hunt down two members of the kingdom, who are quickly killed off-panel before Massacre and his secret puppet master are just as quickly disposed of, just in time for an extremely pointless crossover with Night of the Owls. Yay? Batwing returns to Africa after Matu Ba's entire family are brutally murdered in a terrorist bombing. Ba has been working for David as basically Batwing's Alfred. Ba returns to his homeland, the fictional country of Tundi. Tundi is ruled by another African superperson, Lord Battle. Much like the kingdom, Battle freed his people from tyranny, but then instead of disappearing like they did, he became the new dictator of Tundi closing off the border and enforcing a police state. Winnick's last story arc is a short one involving a cult leader by a brother lost, who is capable of mind control and is responsible for kidnapping a large number of children and forcing them to cut each other's throats. This arc is particularly notable for the introduction of Rachel Niamo, David's friend from the shelter, as the vigilante superhero Dawn. Dawn is awesome. She is very confident, she saves Batwing's butt after he shows up to save her and fails, and she can apparently create awesome electric swords out of thin air. Hell yeah! Sadly, we only get two issues of her badassery, because then Winnick leaves and Fabian Nicieza takes over for the third issue in this arc, and quickly ends it in that same issue. Now, I'm not blaming Nicieza for the drop in quality at this point. I think DC decided that with Winnick gone, they wanted to drop David from their hero list altogether, so he was probably told to bring the series to as quick a conclusion as he could. He does a good enough job at that, however disappointing it may be to lose David. The main problem is that Nicieza has very little respect for the characters and story that has been established so far. Despite Fellow officer and friend Kia Okura, having often hassled David for always being behind his desk, now suddenly he's out in the field, and like, a lot? Originally we were supposed to understand he intentionally stuck to his desk for various reasons, but now he's even complaining about being put back on desk duty? To make matters worse, Matu Ba is then killed off, horribly enough and embarrassingly enough, by an assassin named Sky Pirate. Also, Ba is mentioned as having family in Cape Town, Africa, but earlier we saw them all killed by a bomb, and he even said, they're all dead. So, um, no? Either Nicieza forgot or simply didn't care. Rachel slash Dawn in all her super badassery is also just erased as her job description is changed for no apparent reason from vigilante to mercenary. She also seems to lose her awesome electric swords, replacing them with guns and a bad Darth Vader cosplay. I mean, look at that. What is that? Her final appearance just has her being smashed in the face by Batwing and then lying helplessly on the ground as he demands information from her and tells her to get out of Africa. Way to destroy a badass lady, DC. So disappointing. The point of this arc is largely to push David past his limit until he straight quits Batman Inc. They then turn around and give the mantle of Batwing to Luke Fox, son of Lucius Fox. When I first learned that Luke Fox was a superhero, back before I knew Batwing was a thing, I thought the idea seemed pretty cool. At the time, I assumed he had invented his own tech to become a superhero because he's some kind of super genius like his dad. 
And that wasn't the case, apparently, and instead he's just handed a super high-tech, clearly pre-Batman Beyond prototype, because he was supposedly always Bruce's first choice. This first choice argument is actually disgusting. I get they're trying to legitimize the change of character for people who have been following along, but really this actually just makes things worse. First of all, there's how Batman recruits into Batman Inc. He does this by going around and giving established vigilantes money, tech, and support if they agree to join his Bat Army. That was the case established with David, but that is not the case that we have with Luke. Secondly, there's a horrible implication hidden behind this first choice justification, and that implication is that there can be only one black man in Batman Incorporated. Not one African Batman, one black Batman. If Luke was the first choice and he was passed over for David, a character with absolutely no commonality with Luke except for his skin color, then we are left to assume that Batman considered the two of them in conjunction because he wanted no more than one black man on his bat team. There's absolutely no reason why David needed to give up the wings in order for another black man to join the team. It's actually rather offensive to suggest that he did. On top of that, they even try to make a joke out of it. Yeah, real funny. As long as you're cool with the fact that that literally is the reason. Also, holy crap, Batman smiling is like the creepiest thing ever in the history of creepy. On top of this implication, there's who Luke is. He's a rich kid with a trust fund, whose biggest difficulty in his life is whether his father is going to approve of his life choices to pursue his dreams instead of taking the guaranteed job offers he got after graduating from MIT. His problems are so first world problems that he might as well be white. Then they give him a suit that completely covers him from head to toe. Merge all these things together, and all the white kitties reading this comic can probably just ignore the fact that he even is black. This wouldn't be so much of a problem if we didn't start on David Zavimbe, and if Luke didn't feel like he was basically designed to be David's complete opposite in every way. It also wouldn't be a problem if the comic actually continued to be good, but it doesn't. Jimmy Palmiotti and Justin Gray take over as writers, with art by Eduardo Pansica. Their first story arc just seems to be finishing up what had probably been a planned story arc for David Batwing that mostly deals with some ant-inspired mercenaries in Africa and a super boring villain who runs diamond mines and fancies himself a descendant of Julius Caesar. We then get a tie into the Batman Zero Year story to see what Luke was doing during the Zero Year. Mostly this is to set up an old friend of Luke's, Russell Tavaroff, as a new villain. He was a small kid who got bullied to the point that he injected himself with a venom-like drug and became a monster man. From there we get a Gothtopia tie-in, which, like Zero Year, was another story meant to kill time while all the heroes were quote-unquote dead during Forever Evil. Scarecrow has covered Gotham with a new version of Fear Toxin that makes everyone believe they're in some perfect utopia world. Most of the story here is Luke literally just wandering around not doing anything. Yep. The rest of the series revolves around Luke traveling to the Gotham Underground, the city that exists beneath Gotham City that was introduced to us in the god-awful Anne Nacinti run of New 52 Catwoman. This story would have occurred immediately after that one, so I guess DC really wanted to push this story as hard as they could. Russell, now called Menace, is selling a derivative of the drug that made him a monster. Other people, it just leaves brain dead. So Menace kidnaps both of Luke's sisters and uses the drug on the older one until she is little more than a vegetable. Because if there's one thing we really needed, it's yet another male superhero driven by the man pain over yet another woman in the fridge type situation. When Luke first confronts Russ, Menace straight up kills another woman, which pisses Luke off. Menace then makes the point that it's actually very strange to consider it more tragic that a woman died than if a man had died. You know, it's a real problem when the villain is actually making more sense than the hero. Maybe if Palmiotti and Grey hadn't thought of this logic as only villainous, we wouldn't be dealing with more fridged women in the first place. There's a couple issues that just deal with the fallout from the Gotham Underground stuff, and then a tie into the Future's End event that looks five years into the future of the New 52, before the comic just ends completely. There's no real stopping point or conclusion. It just ends. So let's end this here and get to the break down. If DC had had the guts to continue the David's Vimbe story properly, this could have been a fantastic comic. I feel like Winnick should just take this original concept of Batwing and craft a young adult book around it. Instead, DC just abandons the whole concept, not even halfway in, and replaces it with just another generic, uninspired Gotham vigilante with nothing particularly remarkable about him. It especially hurts that they just couldn't stomach the idea of having two Bat family members that are black, so they basically fire Zvimbe just so they can have Luke fill his role. And that's why I'm giving the series a 6 out of 10. I wish I could give this a higher rating because it started so strong, but the sudden dismissal of the original concept, coupled with the fact that the Luke Fox stuff was pretty disappointing and occasionally downright bad, just left me pretty disappointed with the overall product. Thank you everybody for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe. I'm going to try to get one of these out every Friday, but I can't guarantee right now that that's going to happen, so I'll just try to do as many as I can. 
Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time right here on The Comic Cave.